Hello, everyone. This is Fire Chief Paul Dow with Albuquerque Fire Rescue. Now, this podcast is designed to bring you helpful training and best practices and some additional resources that you can access from anywhere. So thank you for joining us and enjoy today's episode. Stand by all units. Stand by all units. Alarm room two. Engine 317. Uh, brush 10. Brush 1. Engine 2. Bridge and 4th Street. They a little bit south of the Hispanic Cultural Center, 67 Delta 2, uh, Bosky Fire. Caller states she sees uh, flames shooting in the air, about 40, 50 feet right now, so in a circle. Diameter, guys, okay, engine 317, engine 10, brush 10, rescue 1. Battalion 1, we'll put you on that as well, 67 Delta 2. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the AFR podcast. Today we're going to be talking wildland with Lieutenant Brian Fox. Hey Brian, how you doing? Good. Yeah, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, uh, you've been the wildland coordinator now for, uh, you weren't right when I first got in, but shortly thereafter you took over. Yeah, uh, just over five years now. Okay. And how high of a certification do you have for wildland? Uh, currently, uh, task force leader, incident commander type four, and then I'm a division group supervisor trainee. Okay. And then on the all hazards side of things, I'm a operations section chief trainee. And about how many fires do you think you've been on wildland wise? Man, quite a few. I've done, uh, I did 11 fire seasons with the Mexico state forestry. Um, you know, during my structural career, during the summers, taking time off from, you know, the structural departments I've worked for throughout the years. Um, responding to fires in and outside of the state of New Mexico, and then also have deployed to yeah, probably I'd say over 30 fires outside of the state on the New Mexico resource mobilization plan throughout my 22 year career. And have you been uh, kind of different experience levels throughout, or were you a certain position for most of those? Yeah, well, start off, you know, basic level, which we all get right out of uh, the fire academy, which is the firefighter two level, which is the basic uh, courses we get, which is about uh, 56 hours total of training, and then move up to the advanced uh, firefighter level of firefighter type one, and then to engine operator, and then to engine boss, and then keep moving up into the single resource positions after that. You know, in each position I sat probably about two to three years in each position. Uh, sat in the engine boss position for quite some time, so I had a good foundation before moving into overhead and being in charge of, you know, multiple personnel on, you know, high complexity fires. All right, so we've got a pretty big uh, wildland division actually in our department. Can you give us a overview of of our program for some of the newer guys that might not know exactly how big it is yeah so uh, we just added station 22 which adds uh, five stations to the wildland division which gives us 104 personnel assigned to the wildland division uh, everybody at those stations five stations which is station 1 10 16 17 and now station 22 on the west side gives everybody an advanced level of training um, and requires them to you know progress through the uh, task book level of firefighter type one so when we have the west mesa fires the bosky fires foothills fires uh, they're responding in their specialty equipment and what we call the task force dispatch which is um, all 36 personnel i'm sorry all 34 personnel on duty each day plus all the equipment from their stations when we have a large scale wildland incident within the city of Albuquerque. And how frequent is that? So I know you guys uh, are frequently deploying outside of the city, but what about just within Albuquerque? Uh, quite a bit. You know, we had the fire up in the foothills last year, the high desert fire, which, uh, you know, we were initially dispatched. It was uh, about an acre, and as we were arriving on scene, it hit the Arroyo Channel and went upslope with about 20 mile an hour winds and it threatened 11 structures caught three on fire two of the three sustained serious damage uh, we actually got a uh, full dispatch going as well as the wildland task force and uh, loaded it with a bunch of uh, mutual aid resources um, but it, it happens quite often you know it happens in the bosky and our, our method and our, our overall objective for these wildland incidents is we front load them early with resources because it takes a while for crews to get back to their stations if they're out on calls or to uh, get in their gear and respond in their wildland truck and then, you know, to put pumps in place to get down there and start cutting fire line. 
so we front load them early and then we can always back them off if we don't get ahead of them you know and we we launch aircraft from our mutual aid partners uh as well so we we have those contingencies in place didn't you guys have a arsonist running around a while ago was that a few years ago we did so in 2015 we had a a gentleman who we was actually arrested we probably had over 20 fires uh in the bosky from uh, just north of Central all the way down to Bridge and um, the the guy that was arrested uh, was lighting multiple fires even while we were responding and on a, uh, one of the days he was lighting them we were investigating another fire right down the road and the alarm room had reached out to me uh, via phone and said hey we're, we're getting multiple calls are you sure that fire is out that you're investigating and you know, I'm, I'm down there with State Forestry, our arson division. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm here. It's out. They're like, okay, well, uh, to the south of you, we're getting multiple calls of another fire. So myself and uh, one of the gentlemen from State Forestry take off down to the, the fires that were reported south. And as we're approaching the scene, I could see multiple columns of smoke to the south. That's when uh, I radioed to Open Space, who was also responding, and told them the progression. And as they were looking for the individual, they they came across him lighting another fire as I was laying out resources to fight the other four oh, fires. Wow. So yeah. it good team effort. You yeah, know? that but guy yeah. kept you pretty busy then. Huh? He did, yeah. And especially he was lighting fires on days like this as mm. well, you know, with 20, 30 mile an hour winds. Okay, so let's get into some of the conditions. I know... This is a kind of misconception. This used to be in some of the SOGs uh, back in the day about how there's a, a fire season. But can you talk about, you know, some of the conditions that make it more likely for a wildland fire? And Yeah, so as you mentioned, our SOGs used state fire season was from April 15th through the 19th, you know. But here in the southwest, fire seasons become year-round. We're getting active fires eight, an acre in size in December, January, um, you know, and, and with the... the high high moisture that we've had this off season with the snow and and whatnot you know we've seen a lot of annual grasses you know we're looking at three four foot grasses that are your fine fuels your one hour fuels is what we refer to them as um they dry out within you know an hour of of sun and and warm temperatures and wind you know so the nice green grasses that you see on the west mesa that we very rarely see every eight to ten years they'll be dried out brown and primed for extreme fire condition within the next week with these high temperatures that we're having. So that poses a risk to us as firefighters and it changes our response as well because now what used to be patchy fuel and sparse fuel is now heavy and continuous and now moves at a rapid rate of spread. And you mentioned in days like today for the, the viewers out there that can't see outside, well, what's happening right now? Yeah, uh, 30 mile an hour sustained wind gusts to 45, 60 measured at the airport already today. Okay, so some of the the things that are going to increase the uh, likelihood of fire. So if you got increased fuels, you, different weather conditions, you said, yeah. winds, uh, you mentioned humidity. Yeah, you know, humidity with the high winds. You know, we, we had that uh, uh, cold front that just moved out. So you, uh, relative humidity increases, but with the winds, you know, that, that takes it right out of the system. So, you know, we're we're looking at 17 to 20 percent relative humidity today with 75 degree temperatures. And with those winds, you know, these even with the moisture makes for uh, bad conditions. OK, so there's kind of a pretty good chance that something could catch on fire. What does uh, the wildland division do to mitigate mitigate those fires like proactively? Proactively, we do a lot of stuff behind the scenes. Um, so uh, I work with New Mexico State Forestry. I work with City of Albuquerque Open Space very closely. We identify areas of the bosky and the open space areas that have, you know, noxious weeds, uh, heavy fuel load. And then what we do is um, if we use the inmate work crews from New Mexico State Forestry, uh, we actually receive funding to give for those fuel reduction projects. So. 
Um, you know, over the last four or five years while I've had the division, I've been really proactive in getting the fuel reduction uh, things done so we can, um, you know, get in there and manage these fires, you know, better than, than, you know, them taking off and getting to the canopy. So some of the areas that we've done is we did all four sides of Alameda. What a lot of people don't realize is us as the city of Albuquerque have management initial attack rights, um, fire attack rights from basically Isleta to Sandia minus the village of Corrales. So even though it's a state park, we manage the lands and we respond to the lands. Our automatic aid and mutual aid partners pick up a lot of the areas in their jurisdiction, but we we cover quite a bit of it. So we work with open space because we are responsible for managing those lands. So all four sides of Alameda on both sides of the river, we've covered and um, we've done fuel reduction on that. We've done um, near Central, we've done over near Bridge. This year we did a 10 acre project on the northwest side of Central in the river, which was huge because we have a lot of uh, homeless population in that area. And, you know, we, we were uh, determining that it seemed that that was a lot of the causes was, you know, campfires or cooking fires that they were using. So, you know, we did that to mitigate. And then also uh, behind Bosky School, um, we're going to do phase two of that next year. And then we just received a million dollar grant from Department of Homeland Security and Emergency Management to do an additional 500 acres beginning two years from now. Okay, so I was... Uh at station 16 for a little bit and that was a few years ago and we would we used to go down to the bosky and patrol around mm -hmm. uh, a couple hours a day can you talk about that and has there been any changes yeah so uh back in 2014 we changed what we used to call bosky patrol which would only cover the bosky you know that was something um we as a department implemented in 2004 after the fires we had in 03 and 04 um, where we would put crews in the brush trucks and then they would respond or they would patrol and then they'd be the initial attack truck for the bosky so we've now because we have over 29,000 acres of city of albuquerque open space lands we now call it call it the um, open space patrol plan so now it encompasses the foothills the west mesa and the bosky um, so what it does is it reduces the reflex time and it puts our members in their wildland PP in their truck, wildland truck, and they patrol those three areas. Um, as you can imagine, over the last five to six years, we've seen an increased population and recreational use inside the Bosque. So it's really hard to get the trucks down in there to drive around and to, you know, and to visualize smoke when they're down in the valley itself. So. Um, you know, we encourage the crews to get to high points, you know, and, and patrol the outsides of the Bosque along the main roads, you know, Rio Grande Boulevard, Coors Road, and then a tramway, you know, and then up in the on the west side, um, you know, and then just be a, basically a citywide initial attack truck for, for wildland fires. So let's say now you're on 16, as you mentioned, and you're doing patrol and all of a sudden Engine 8 gets dispatched to a fire uh, you know, at the top of Indian School or somewhere where it sounds like there may be a little bit of potential where they'll need a brush truck, you just simply would attach yourself as brush 16 to that incident. Brush 16 to alarm, be advised, we're on open space patrols. Go ahead and detach us with Engine Eight's uh, outside fire. And for these open space patrols, how frequent are they? What are the hours and uh, how does the rotation go for those? Good question. So we, this weekend, every Memorial Day weekend, we implement open space patrols. So we start with level one, which means we have one truck out from 1230 in the afternoon to seven o'clock at night. Now they only have a half hour of an overlapping time as 10 days before the 4th of July, when fireworks sales begin, we go into what we call level two patrols. Then we start at 12 noon and we go till 7.30 at night. And then we overlap the two trucks during our peak burn periods um, early afternoon. So we have two trucks out the majority of the, the peak burn period where you know the relative humidity is low, temperatures are high, and wind speeds where the fuel will burn most uh, primed. All right. Um, if somebody hasn't been to a wildland station yet and they've, they're interested in it or if, you know, they've been in for a little bit but they want to try something new, maybe go on a deployment, how does somebody get involved in the wildland division? So uh, 
anybody can open a task book. I encourage it. You know, even prior to having the classes, I, I still will open a task book. There's nothing that says we can't. We are allowed to open task books prior to our individuals having the classes. And the reason I do that is so they don't miss opportunities. So if they have a fire and they need to get a size up or they need to get a lookout or any of the other signatures in the book, they're able to do so. And then they can, we, I, I've made it very user friendly. Anything that we require you to have as a department to be at a wildland station is available to self assign and target solutions the S133, the look up, look down, all around class, and then the intermediate wildland fire behavior course, the S290, is also available in target solutions. Anything you're required to get in seat, the S131 course, which is a 10 hour in seat course. We've created wildland training groups. We have wildland training group one and two, so we can bring you up on duty for those courses or SAW recertifications or any other training we think you need as a wildland station. So it's become really user friendly. You know, in the past we used to have, we'd require you to get, you know, we'd give you for each class you got, we'd move you up on the seniority list and it just, you know, it was an equal opportunity where now it has become such. We provide the training for you on duty. So again, if you want to open a task book, regardless if you're at a wildland station or not, you can email me. I'll open up a task book. If you come into our department with prior experience, I, I'll meet you for coffee. I'll come out to your station, get your classes, your certifications, see where you at. I'll put you into our database. We're New Mexico State Forestry manages our database uh, through an incident qualification system. It's an online system. It's called IQS and I'm required to input all of our personnel, every department member into that. Everybody is in there, all 600 and some odd personnel. New Mexico State Forestry logs into that periodically and makes sure that those are up to par, much like the EMS Academy does, or EMS Bureau does for our EMT qualifications and paramedic qualifications. So there's a lot of, you know, streamlined stuff that has to happen. So we report to New Mexico State Forestry who manages us. That's why we're required to follow the National Wildfire Coordinating Group uh, qualifications. All right. So if somebody is interested in uh, getting on one of these deployments over the summer, how does that work? And what is the minimum requirement you need to be able to get on one of those deployments? Um, how much money do you make? How long are you gone? Some of those questions. Are you able to answer those? Yeah, yeah. So um, signing up for the wildland deployments, you go into telestaff. Uh, you, you have to sign up for 14 days straight. It's the sign up um, call is uh, WLDEP, and you can't have any trade time off or trade time work because you can't be in two statuses. And as a department, we can't come back and submit for reimbursement for your straight time work, but we paid somebody else your trade. We're paying you twice or pay you overtime while your trade's working your straight time. Uh, so you're not allowed to have any trades during that time frame. And then we can't, you know, it, it's it's strictly overtime because we can't give you comp time and then submit for a monetary amount from New Mexico State Forestry under the RMP. Um, so we get paid for our equipment, whatever it be, whether it's a rescue, type 1 engine, type 6 engine, or type 3 engine. Uh, we also have a new REM vehicle, which we'll talk about here in a little bit. but. Um, so once you sign up in Telestaff, you also email me letting me know you signed up. That way if, you know, Telestaff crashes or anything, we have a secondary means knowing that uh, I can go into my email Dropbox where I put all the signups and, and find who, who signed up as well. Um, you can sign up as a firefighter type 2, again, which is the lowest qualification in our department. Um, but when we fill these orders, if it's an engine, we have to have an engine boss, an engine operator, and then we, we have to have a minimum of a third firefighter. It ha we'll, we prefer to send a firefighter type 1, but if we don't have one available, we will send a firefighter type 2. And sometimes the fire chief in New Mexico State Forestry will let us send a fourth person so we can work on their training and qualifications as well. So everybody's a firefighter type two just by going through the academy and doing your pack test every year. Correct. Everybody yeah. within our within AFR is a firefighter type two and can deploy. That's correct. Cool. Um, and so you're gone for 14 days. Yeah. So an in-state assignment, um, we can negotiate. So let's say we send out an engine with three people. After the fifth day, we can request to. Um, swap personnel but that expense is to us as Albuquerque Fire so if I have three guys that say they can go up to 14 days and I have you know one guy that says he can go to five 
us as a department the the better decision you know so it doesn't become a, a financial uh, burden on us is to not sw swap personnel and pay additional overtime to do so we're going to send the three guys that can go 14 days and that's in our policies um, so yeah in state could be a five day could be a 10 day when you go out of state it's it's 14 working days so you could have two three days travel on each end depending on where you go you know we've gone to north carolina south carolina uh we've gone to texas we've gone to california we've gone to oregon montana so you know i've been gone up to 21 days you know where we will go 14 and then we extend for seven and then we have travel days on top of that so you're looking at 26 to 27 days the way the overtime works is you get paid for your actual hours on the incident. So usually we work 16 hour shifts. So um, the other eight hours that you're sitting in camp, you're not compensated for, um, but you do get the overtime hours of 16 hours of actual work. So it is good overtime, you know, it, it, and what it does, is it brings back good experience to our department and then it gets you through your your task books and moves you up through your qualifications. So it's, uh, it's, it's invaluable experience, you know, and then the other, the other, uh, you know, good thing to it is, um, you know, it, you learn what resource you go out on, you learn how to operate it well. Yeah. Uh, I guess I had a question about the deployment specifically. So you're attached to that resource, right? Um, are they, uh, what are the guys going to be doing out there? Are they going to be digging, um, fire line or are they just, attached to that resource the whole time yeah so you never know um y you can pretty much depend if you out on a type one engine which is our class a pumpers our, our frontline resources that we have frontline engines we use here in the city of albuquerque that you're going to be doing structure protection wherever you go you know which is you know you're you're standing by so when the fire front hits the homes or values at risk when we're in point protection you're actually able to protect with you know large volumes of water and make interior uh, fire attacks if you need to initially anything outside of that if it's a type one type three you really don't know you know you could be constructing fire line you could be burning out you could be falling trees you may be if you go out as a task force of engines or a strike team of engines um, you know you may be assembled um, as a hand crew 20 person hand crew and you may be constructing fire line all day every day okay um let's talk about money because everybody likes money um you mentioned overtime about how many hours say you're on a two-week deployment how many hours would you say you're going to end up getting on that overtime if you're on a 96 what are we looking at we're looking at uh you know 64 hours of overtime on your days off you know and you get through three cycles of you know overtime depending if it's a 21 day i mean that's that's quite a bit of quite a bit of money nice and then for the uh, department, how much does this wildland division bring in? Uh, quite a bit. Uh, so last year, you know, unfortunately we weren't able to go out during the peak fire season and then in New Mexico's uh, fire season because of staffing issues. You know, obviously our highest priority is here, the city of Albuquerque. Um, so once, you know, an academy class graduated in mid June, we were able to start sending resources out. So we began. We only send resources out for a month and a half, and we brought back uh, $470,000 approximately. Year before, we brought uh, back just under 600000 Oh, wow. You know, and, and same thing. And, and from what I understand is we got a new truck that's going to get us some more money. Uh, can you talk about that, Rem yeah. Team? Yeah, so uh, we actually, two trucks. I'll, I'll talk about the, the rapid extraction module, and then I'll, also we just put Brush 22 into service yesterday, oh, okay. which was... And I'll talk about that here in a minute. But um, so, yeah, we just put our we just got a REM team into service. We spent one hundred and ten thousand um, dollars, well, one hundred and twenty thousand dollars total for the UTV, the uh, truck to pull the UTV and then also all the equipment to go on it. So what the rapid extraction module is, is it's a it's a team of firefighters, two paramedics and two EMT basics who go out on wildland fires and they act much like a RIT team does for structure fires. They stage at a drop point, they have uh, high angle rope rescue equipment, they carry a, a hydraulic combi tool um, and they work under the medical unit leader and anytime there is a firefighter that may be trapped under a tree or a fire apparatus that rolls over or somebody gets hurt or passes out in a uh, location that a what they refer to in wildland, what we call rescues, that where an ambulance or a transport unit can't make it, 
the rapid extraction module is dispatched to that patient. They provide critical care, stabilize the patient, um, extract them or extricate them if they need it, and then they extract them and prepare them for air or ground transport um, via, you know, uh, whether it's, a, you know, long line from a helicopter or it's uh, um, into a vehicle. Awesome. And yeah. I think, uh, I believe you sent an email out a while back. Just again, if you're interested, get with you, send you an email yeah, so expressing you, your interest. Yeah. So same thing, uh, you know, shoot me an email that you're interested. Um, so we're looking for personnel that are qualified with uh, rope rescue two qualifications. We're getting ready to uh, get those personnel who sent me those emails prior uh, UTV certification because you have to have that when you go out and you're operating the UTV. Um, you know, and, and we're really tapping into our guys from our HTR division. You know, I'm working side by side with Lieutenant Carlson, who runs our HTR division, um, you know, and we're putting together uh, some individuals who we'll be using for a call out list for this. Um, you know, and the HTR guys have our, our uh, Rope Rescue 2 qualifications at this time right away. We've already got about six wildland guys that have went out and got their rope rescue two qualifications since we've announced this. Um, so we're getting a good pool of uh, individuals to pull from. And then back to what the equipment makes. So you ask the monetary amount of that, you know, so the REM team makes $160 an hour for the equipment. And then the personnel assigned to that equipment, we get reimbursed for their straight time and overtime as well as we do for our other equipment. Our type six engines, our brush trucks make $99 an hour. And then our type one engines make 165 an hour. And then our uh, type three engine, engine 317 makes $120,000 an hour. Okay, so it was a little bit of an investment by the department, but the thought is it's gonna pay off um yeah, Down I mean, line. absolutely. I mean, what we just spent, and then I just got approval to buy another um, wildland um, truck uh, for what we're going to replace for the wildland assistant coordinator, uh, which we'll be purchasing in the next couple weeks. Uh, we just put Brush 22 into service, which Councillor Borrego paid for $150,000 for us to purchase, and then the $20,000 that we used for the to purchase the equipment. Uh, was also spent with deployment money that we went out on uh, fires on the 2018 fire season. Awesome. Well, I think that's a pretty good uh, overview of the the program, how you can deploy, how you get more involved, and how you can work your way up um, different certification levels. Um, just for the guys that are not at a wildland station and say they're just on an engine and they get dispatched out to like a 67 outside fire call, um, can you give them some advice on what, what they should be doing, initial actions? Yeah, so, you know, back in the day, uh, wildland fires were coded 67 Bravos, you know, but there was some some corrections that needed to be made to that. You know, 67 Bravos, which are our most common outside fire dispatch, is for trash fires, you know, couch fires, um, you know, something other than a grass or brush fire. 67 Charlie is your uh, grass fire small wildland fire you know so you'll get the closest uh, engine response if the dispatcher from the alarm room feels like it doesn't warrant a response of a brush truck they'll simply take the brush truck off and send the single engine if it's in you know foothills or somewhere that borders where they think they'll need a brush truck they'll leave it on it and you'll get a you'll get a an engine and a brush truck and then we move on into the 67 delta dispatches which is basically a level two response you know um, the first level of the 67 Delta is uh, about half of the, the Wildland Task Force. And then the second level of the w 67 Delta is the full task force. So let's say you're on Engine 8 and you get dispatched to a fire. Again, we'll use Indian School, the east end of Indian School for a uh, 67 Charlie. And it's you and Brush 16 who are responding. Upon arrival, you come across a fire with structures threatened with two acres already and it's moving up slope with a rapid rate of uh, speed. Immediately, you need to punch the task force dispatch. You just call the alarm and you give your size up and then it take command, give your size up and at the end of your size up, engine eight to alarm, give me the wildland task force. And the wildland and then the alarm room knows to give you all five stations, all personnel assigned, including all wildland equipment. And then that will also get myself and the DC of operations uh, dispatched to it as well. 
So we all know you're you're probably going to have your radio on you, and if you heard a, a dispatch like that go out, what are you expecting to hear from that initial pumper? You talked about the size up, but I, for those that aren't familiar with uh, Wildland size up, what are you wanting to hear? You know, because you're probably on your way. What do you want that first engine crew to get across to you? Yeah. So the biggest thing we're looking for is you know, um, keep your crew safe and the public safe number one priority. You know, we there's some things we want to identify. You know. Um, going through the flow of things, and I'll go over that here in a minute, but identify the values at risk, evacuate the public, and build the incident. You know, don't be afraid to ask for the task force. We can always scale it down. As I mentioned earlier, there is a huge delayed response with a task force response. So to get them going early is crucial. So don't be afraid to build the incident. If you call me and tell me you want something, or if I hear something over the radio, even if you say you want aircraft who, who can only be ordered through New Mexico State Forestry through myself or the assistant wildland coordinator or the duty officer if I'm out on another fire on an assignment, we always have somebody backing us up. Um, I'm not going to question that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start making those orders, you know, uh, and then I'll make a needs and a risk assessment when I get there. So, um, you know, size up the fire. What we're looking for is, you know, flame height, size of fire, you know, your rate of spread, is it high, slow, moderate, you know, and then uh, we're going to look, we're going to, we require you to, you know, implement LCS with your crew, lookouts, communications, escape routes. That doesn't need to be over the radio. That can be in the cab of the truck prior to getting out or once, as soon as your boots hit the ground. But every officer is responsible for doing that. And then give, and if you, if you know the land ownership, if, if it's forest service at the end of Indian school, if it's open space, that way I can start pre-planning and calling the right uh, mutual aid partners and getting some additional resources and then taking command. That's really what we're looking for. We're not looking for you to geek out and give this long, you know, hot shot, smoke jumper, you know, uh, drawn out fire size up. Once I get there, we'll help you do that, you know, um, and then also include what fuels are involved. You know, is it brush, grass, pinyon, juniper, pine trees, you know, what does it look like, you know, and and what a lot of guys don't understand is w even if it's west of, or I'm sorry, east of the fence line, so if we're responding to Indian school again, if it's east of the fence line, that is Forest Service land, but we have MOUs in place with them that um, we have thousands of acres in the East Mountains of the City of Albuquerque open space lands that the Forest Service handles for us because we're too far away. So we do the same for them here on the west face of the Sandia. So immediately, I will call Forest Service, tell them what we have and what's responding. And if they have resource available, they'll respond. And unfortunately, if they don't, then that's something that we as a department, then we take command, we coordinate aircraft, and we sit on it until they come. So we may assemble crews to go up and handle it. We may sit down at the bottom and monitor it. Um, you know, but it becomes pretty taxing as a department, you know, and then the other side of that is, you know, we're, we're a department that runs over 100,000 calls annually. When you have a population of, you know, 600,000 people below a fire on the west face of the Sandias, they're calling 911 until the fire is put out, you know, so getting that public messaging out is another component to that as well. So there's a lot of stuff we're starting behind the scenes. So basically, you know, that basic size up really sets the tone for the incident getting those additional resources, and then protecting the values at risk, you know, and, and if you're not a wildland guy and you're not comfortable with engaging, you know, again, protect the values at risk, start early evacuations, and get the task force going. Yeah, so we talked about the initial size up actions. What about just the mindset? Um, this is the last point I want to cover is we're used to responding to structure fires, and we got the life safety, incident stabilization, property conservation. So how does that differ in the in the wildland approach? Yeah, so we so we flip it a little, you know. So in wildland, it's it, it flips a little. It goes uh, life safety, life safety, property conservation, and then incident stabilization. And the reason we do that is because the the fire may be thirty acres in size. You know, we're not going to stabilize that before we protect property. So we turn it to property conservation after life safety because we might go into point protection. Because again, we want to save the values at risk, you know, being private residents, schools, um, and then critical infrastructure, pump houses, uh, uh, cell phone and radio towers, things like that. That's going to affect our infrastructure if they burn down. 
So just have the, the mindset, this is going to be a much longer incident than responding to a structure fire where you're hopefully going to put it out in like 15 minutes. Correct. Yeah. And if, you know, and if we do get a, a, a long extended wildland fire, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to put the task force units on it, you know? So we ask the, the, uh, normal stations, if you will, um, that are part of our department to know that they're going to engage and they're going to be involved for a bit. But after that initial attack, we're going to transition them off the, the incident to go back to response. And once we start getting in some of our other mutual aid partners like state forestry, forest service and then we'll keep the wildland task force stations of our department on it for the duration because they're trained and that's what they're expected to do it for being at one of the five wildland stations awesome well thank you brian and uh anybody out there if you're interested just go ahead and email lieutenant fox if you want to get involved in the program do you have any closing comments no i appreciate your time and yeah everybody be safe out there all right everybody well I'll talk to you on the next episode thank you for listening